Praise God. You know what I'm excited about? I'm excited about the Word of God, but I'm also excited about the time change. Now, it doesn't feel like midnight. It's not going to feel like midnight at 7 o'clock in the evening. Praise God for that. God said, let there be light. Come on. Um, go with me to Matthew chapter 6. As you're turning there, I want to mention to all the men, you know, we, we saw that, that uh, MOI, uh, Men of Iron uh, uh, deal in um, uh, kind of a little st- uh, uh, pr- uh, promo. And um, man, I just want to encourage you. There's three things I would never miss if I was, uh, <clears throat> if I was uh, and I wouldn't let my wife miss, um, if I was just attending the, the church, I would never miss the Joy of Marriage Conference because, man, I, I, I like going to hang out with my wife, and I like growing. I know that the key to a successful, loving, beautiful marriage uh, is investing in it. And Julie and I, you know, we've been married 28 years, and so we know that's the key. And so we would always go to the Joy of Marriage Conference whatever it took to get there. Then I would make sure I always went to the Men of Iron Conference. I'm hoping this year I can take all five of my sons. And so I'm hoping all five of my sons will be able to attend with me. And so that'll be the first time that all of us are together. I have a tribe, man. I have a tribe. And so I don't have a family. I have a tribe. But, uh, um, and, and I would never miss that. And ladies, the first time I went, Julie paid my way and then did not tell me uh, until after the refund time was over because she knows that I would not waste that money. And so I was there. I was mad. I was a little, I'm like, why, why would you do that? And she's like, cause I want you to go. You need to go. She just knew she knew I was supposed to be there. And, um, so I, even the day I left, I was frustrated because I was so busy. I thought my life's always been busy and I like it busy. So I was just, I'm just, I, so I threw my stuff in a bag and I went, she loaded me up with all these guys I didn't know. And they took me to, I didn't know them. I didn't, we had just been there at the church for about a month or so. And I knew the guys who were holding the event, but, and so I went and man, it changed my life. I had a destiny door open up to me right after the men of iron. I mean, it changed my whole life right after the men of iron. It was the, the next weekend, boop, that door opened. And because of what happened at the men of iron. So I want to encourage you, wives, send your husbands. Men go. You will not regret being, but there's a limit. There's only 1,500 men allowed this year. And that's, that's how full that thing is. So you have to get in early. Also, I'm carrying around this with me. Bree talked about our, our upcoming drama called Choices. I think it's the best drama we've ever done. We've done some incredible ones. I think this one's the best one we've ever written. We wrote this drama in the best one we've ever done. And so we have some cards that you can hand out out in the foyer to invite people. And then we have our T-shirts. These are free. We have only 500 of them, so they're going to go quick. Uh, And so this is our advertisement. So we're giving them out free. But we ask you, if you take one, that you wear it every chance you can. Some of you can wear them to work. Some of you can't. But once you get home, if you're going to Walmart, Ace Hardware, you're going to McDonald's, I don't care where you're going, ball game, wherever, we ask that you put it on. You have to wash it every night. Hopefully. For other people's sake, you'll have to wash it every night. And so, and I, and we're, we're going to do the same thing. And we're going to wear these every day for the next couple of weeks because we're, and then people, you know, they'll see 500 t-shirts out here. If we have to order more, we'll order a few more, but, uh, they'll see these t-shirts. They're going to ask you what, well, I see that everywhere. What's going on. And I want, and I want you to invite them to come. That's, that's going to be Palm Sunday, the weekend before Easter. Then on Easter, I'm, I'm believing to see a uh, hundred plus people get water baptized on it. What a great day to get baptized. If I'd have thought differently, if I just would have thought a little bit differently, I would have, I would have got baptized on Easter, you know, but it's just a good time to get baptized. And so man, plan on that. We have whole families get baptized together. <coughs> uh, man, it's incredible. And so uh, sign up for that. Be part of that. Easter's going to be awesome. But Palm Sunday, we're doing the drama. We'll do it Friday night, Saturday night, and two Sunday morning service. So we'll only have two services on Palm Sunday. So uh, be prepared for that too. Anyway, uh, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, the title of my message this morning is, What Are We Saved From? What are we saved from? We know what we're saved to. We're saved to heaven. But what are we saved from? And quite often I talk about what we're saved to. Because God says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. But in doing that, we have to fix our eyes on what Jesus taught. What Jesus taught. And so I'm going to talk about that here in just a moment. But in Matthew 6, it says this. Um, 
Do not be like them, them being unbelievers, for your father in heaven. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. And then it goes on to say in in chapter 7, in verse 7, it says, Keep on asking, and it will be given you. Keep on seeking, you will find. Keep on knocking reverently, the door will be open to you. So he's he's basically saying that I already know what you have need of, but I want you to keep asking, seeking, and knocking until you get your answer. And so this is what I love about God. He, He has everything we need in his hands, Already prepared because he's so thoughtful that he already has it for us. And I don't know about you, but I, I really, really like it when, like, I'll forget something and I'll say, oh, Julie, I forgot. And I see this little smile on her face like, like women get like, mm-hmm, I, I'm smarter than you, you know. And I'll say, I'll look and I'll see that. Now I know that look. I'll go, what would you do? And she said, I already did it for you. Or I'll ask her for something. I'll say, Julie, I need. And she's, she's got it in her hand. I already know what you need here. And, and that blesses me incredibly. And that's how our father is. He already has it. And so when you ask, he's like, here. He already, he already has it. He knew when Adam sinned. When Adam rebelled against God, he already had salvation prepared for us. He'd already prepared heaven for us. He already prepared Jesus to go and die for us. He already had it prepared. So that when people ask, that's why it's so it happens in a split second. That's why it happens in just a moment of prayer, is because he's already prepared to save your life. He's already prepared to rescue you. Salvation means rescue, deliverance. He's already prepared to deliver you. He's already prepared to rescue you. So that's why as soon as someone asks, it happens instantaneously. He's already prepared it. That's the God we serve. He's so incredibly kind. But I want you to, I want you to understand something, church, that what he saved us from is a horrible existence. It's not, it's not just horrible on earth. People say, well, I'm living hell on earth. No, you're not. No, I, I don't name, describe to me the worst human life ever lived. And I'll tell you, that's not hell. Because that's not forever. And hell is forever. Jesus, this is what I wanted to tell you. Jesus talked more about hell than every other prophet and writer of the entire New Testament and Old Testament combined. Let me say that again. Jesus Christ, our Lord, talked more about what he saved us from than every other author in the entire Bible combined. If you took all the times hell was mentioned and then just look at the Gospels when Jesus mentioned it, he is outnumbered them all. Why? Because he, not, he doesn't want us just to know where he saved us to. He wants us to understand what he saved us from. And that's what I'm going to talk about the next couple of weeks. That's what Choices talks about. Not just what he saved us to, but what he saved us from. Go with me to Romans chapter 2. We're going to read from there in just a moment. Romans chapter 2. But before we do... I just want to give you some names. You know, in the Old Testament, they called it Sheol or Guiana. Uh, and their reference was to um, a bottomless pit burning with fire. And Guiana was a reference, and Sheol was also a reference. And the, the example they used was that outside of Jerusalem, they had, to, they had trash, right? They had trash. They had to do away with their trash. So outside of Jerusalem was a trash dump. It'd be like this dump down here. And they would, instead of burying it, they would burn it. So you could imagine if they were burning trash out here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The smoke would rise and the stench would rise constantly. And that's what their, that was their natural example of what hell was like, that it burns forever. It's a stench. It's awful. And that's their reference point in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's called Hades. When you see the word translated hell in English, it's the word Hades. It 
It's also called the lake of fire. Do you know one of the, when they ask people, what, what, what's, the, what's the number one way you don't want to die? What do you think people say? Burning alive. They'd rather drown, they'd rather do anything than burn alive. Anything. Because it's, and it's, the, it's the greatest torment, the greatest punishment. And that's what Jesus, that's why he loved us so much. He wanted to save us from that. Because, because an act of rebellion against God, it ends up, because when we rebel against an infinite, forever God, the punishment is infinite and forever. That's why Jesus is not a way to heaven. He's the only way to heaven. You can't get there any other way. In 2011, they did a survey. I haven't found a current one. I'd like to see one if they've done one. They surveyed and asked people if they believed in hell, and 75% of people believed in hell. Does someone want to mention a percentage of people who thought they were going there? How many people out of the 75% that said we believe in hell thought they were going there? Zero, that's a number. It's, it's a little higher than that. How much? Two, a little higher, not 12. In between two and 12, you're getting there. Four, someone said four. Four percent of the 75% of people that believed in hell thought they were going there. I think that's an amazing number. Most funerals, everybody goes to heaven. But can I tell you something? The Bible says most won't. Most human beings, 20 billion people have lived on the earth. He said most won't make it to heaven. Most. That word most means the majority. Jesus died for all of us to go to heaven. He wants all of us to go to heaven. But it says in the Bible, most will not. So that percentage is so far off. When I did, and I, I know this to be true, I did street ministry in Lubbock for several years. And I taught people how to do street ministry. And what we would do is I, I would take a survey. And so I'd knock on the door and say, hey, I'm taking a survey in your neighborhood. Can I ask you a question? And they would say, sure. And I'd say, my survey question is this. If you died today, would you go to heaven or hell? And I was really taking a survey. We really did survey the whole neighborhood. And, and mo- almost all of them would, would hesitate for a second and then say heaven. So then I'd ask them the next question on the survey. Why do you believe that? Well, well, I do more good than bad. I'm a good person. Um, um, um. That was their, most of their answers. But I remember two distinctly. There was one woman and one young man that answered the question. And I knocked on the door of the young man. I'll just tell you his story. And I asked him, and he said, by the way, both of them I led to Jesus. But I asked the young man. He came to the door. He lived by Texas Tech. Beer cans all over the front yard. He came to the door. He had real long hair in his underwear. So I knocked on the door. Saturday morning, 9 o'clock, right? He probably just went to bed. And I kept knocking until he came. So he's like, he opened the door, and he's, he's pretty cool. Tall, thin guy. He opened the door, and he said, oh, dude. I, I, was, I started laughing. He said, man, it's so early. What are you doing here at my house? And I said, I'm taking a survey. He's like, oh, man, I just, man, I just want to sleep. I'm saying, just answer my survey question. He said, okay, ask me quick, man, answer me quick. So I, I asked him the question, and he said, oh, man, that's just heavy <laughs> question. And he sat there, and he goes, I think I'll go to heaven. He stopped. Then he said, I, I, I don't. He was about to say, I don't know. And he stopped himself. And his shoulders slumped. Same thing with the woman I talked to. She was probably in her 30s. Same thing. Stopped, shoulders slumped over, head dropped. He said, nah, man, I know I'd go to hell. Two only honest people. And I said, do you want to go to hell? He said, no, man, I don't. I said, well, will you talk to me? He says, sure, man. He said, I'll be right back. So he shut the door. I thought he was going to get clothes on. That, I was mistaken. I think he went to the bathroom. I think he went to the bathroom because he came back out in his underwear. I'm thinking, 
thought he'd throw some shorts in the church. He didn't. And he sat on the front porch in his underwear. And I talked to him for about an hour. And I led him to Jesus right then. And I thought about him today. as I, was, I knew I was going to preach this sermon. That's why I was talking about him. I thought about him today and I prayed for him. I said, Father, if he's not serving you right now, cause that moment to, to come into his mind. Where he and if he is serving you, Father, man, encourage him. But he was honest, but most people aren't honest. Why? Because they just don't want to believe they're going there. And in our current culture, you know, when I was in sin, I knew if someone was to say to me, Troy, you're rolling, you're partying, you're doing all this. Do you think you're doing what's right? And I'd go, no, I, I'm, I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong. All my friends would say, I know I'm wrong. They'd all say, I know I'm wrong. I know we're not doing right. But in today's culture, it's totally different. You ask somebody, are you doing what's right? They'll say, man, yeah, man, I'm doing my thing. I'm, this is right. It's right for me. They would not say it was wrong. The worst guys I knew in the world would say, I know I'm not doing right. But in today's culture, it's exactly what God said. In the last days, they'll say what is right is wrong and what wrong is right. So they'll say to Christians, we're the enemy because we, have, we say there's a standard of sexuality. There's a standard of lying. There's a standard of this and a standard of that. We're not perfect at it, but we believe that God is right and everybody else is wrong. The Bible says that God be true and every man a liar. That's what we believe. That God, only a holy, loving God could decide what is right and wrong for humanity. That human beings aren't capable of doing it themselves because we would all end up with what was ever right and wrong for me. And guess what? If it was right for me to kill you, then that would be right for me. It'd be wrong for you, right for me, right? If it was right for me to cheat on my wife, it'd be right for me, wrong for her. But we have accepted adultery. We've accepted fornication. We've, we've accepted homosexuality. Matter of fact, the voices become so loud of defending themselves. They wanted, the, Satan wanted, and the people wanted their voice to rise so that it's now culturally accepted to do whatever you want to do sexually. Lying is culturally accepted. It blows my mind. Sometimes I have to just shut the TV off when I hear political commentators, whether they're Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter. They all say the same thing. Well, you know, they make all these promises when they're running, and then they, you know, they don't expect to keep them. No one expects them. I'm like, it's called lying. But they won't. You know what they call it? They call it politics. And they just accept, and then they kind of laugh about it. And they say, well, that's what we do too. That's how we live our lives. And then some of them call themselves Christians. That we're more outraged and we should be outraged by a school shooting of 17. We should be outraged. We should be hurt. Then 62 million babies aborted in the womb. Because 62 million babies, that's right. Isn't that how they, they def, it's my right to choose. They'll kill you. They'll fight you over their right to choose to kill those children. A right to an abortion. We live in a totally different world, and that's why I'm preaching this. And they would tell you, people like that would tell you, I'm going to heaven. I've had people look me right in the face that are living together and without any repentance have no desire to change it, don't honor marriage, and that would just look me in the face and say, well, I'm still going to heaven. I'm still, I'm, I, you know, I'm a lesbian, I'm still going to heaven, I'm almost, I'm still going to heaven. How dare you tell me I'm not going to heaven? I'm still going to heaven. I'm disobedient to God. I don't believe that God decides what's right and wrong, but I'm still going to heaven. I hear people say that on TV all the time. Can I say something to you? Without submission to the Lord Jesus Christ and receiving his love and his forgiveness, but his lordship, that he decides right and wrong for your life, you cannot attain heaven. You cannot go to heaven without that. If you're going to decide what is right and wrong, you will not go to heaven. Romans 2. Verse 4 says this. This is so powerful. God's so kind. 
He said, or are you so blind as to trifle with and presume upon and despise? Everybody say despise. And underestimate the wealth of his kindness and forbearance and long-suffering patience. Are you unmindful? Otherwise, you're not thinking about of actually or actually ignorant of the fact that God's kindness is intended to lead you, you to repent, to change your mind and inner man, to accept God's will. Not your will, God's will. What is he talking about right there? He's saying, because there's not an immediate penalty for sin, because the moment you sin, you don't get zapped by a lightning bolt. There's not an immediate impact. Matter of fact, for a while it feels good. Can someone agree with me? Sometimes sin feels good. And for a moment it feels good. So there's not, so the immediate impact is that it kind of feels good. It can feel good. For immediate impact, it can feel good. So you don't get an immediate punishment. And he's saying here, don't you get that God's being patient and kind to you? Why would you take that for granted and continue to do that? Don't take his his kindness for granted that he doesn't zap us all when we say, I'm grateful he does it. But he said, don't take that for granted. Now, here's what else he says, verse 5. But by your callous stubbornness and impotence of heart, you are storing up wrath and indignation. It's not just stubbornness. It's, now it's callous stubbornness. It's, I don't care what God says. God's the enemy. Christianity's the enemy. I serve the God of love, not the God of the Bible, because he loves me so much there's no punishment for sin. There is no right and wrong. I get to decide it. That's the God they've created in their own mind. That's the God they've, they've dreamed up in their own mind. He, they've created him. Just He said, do not create gods in the image of animals. Do not create any image. But they have created an image. They've created this image of God that is just a man pleaser. Oh, yeah, I created you to be an adulterer, a murderer, a liar, a cheater, a homosexual. I created you to be, when you're a boy, to be a girl, a girl to be a boy. I created you that way. Really? One of Those thoughts are some of the most ignorant thoughts I've ever heard. If God created you to be a woman, then you're a woman. If he created you to be a man, you're a man. You're, now you're arguing, listen, now they're arguing with creation itself. And it's callous stubbornness. It's not even, I'm digging in, it's callous. It's like, ugh, you Christians. Ugh, the Bible. Ugh, that Christian God that would ever tell me that I'm wrong. I've had people get up and walk out of service when I've talked about these things. They're callously stubborn. You know how they got there? One step at a time. One act of rebellion at a time hardens your heart. Till you become callously stubborn. Doesn't happen overnight. Just like being a, you know, living right doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. It's a process to get callously stubborn too. And this culture wants to callously, callously make us stubborn. I've had people sit in this church when I talk about it, especially young people, and just glare at me when I talk about these things like transvestitism or homosexuality or adultery or fornication or living together. I mean, just glare at me. Kids, young men and young women that were raised in this church. And I'm like, who's influencing you? And what are you thinking? Wow, don't shake your fist at God. You won't win. This isn't a threat. When I used to grow up and hear these hellfire and brimstones, it was like a threat. It's like they were beating me up with it. This isn't a threat, guys. God intended it. The reason Jesus talked about it more than anybody, it's a warning. It's a warning. Coach, if you were driving down the road and I knew the bridge was out and I was in front of you, would you, would you think it kind of me if I just let you keep driving? No, you would think it kind of me if I warned you or I put a sign up that says, warning, bridge out. This is the warning. It's a big, massive warning. Warning, hell exists. Hell is open for business. Hell has no, it never stops burning. So it's, it wants you there. Satan hates you. He wants you there with him. That's why he's sowing those lies. That's why 
After money, the second thing that most pastors don't want to preach, the second thing is on hell. They'd rather you hear a story about two dogs and a little boy or a girl and a pony and at a Reader's Digest and then tell you how all this other stuff, about all this other stuff. And we know God is good all the time. And we know that God wants to provide and bless and care and heal. We know he wants to do those things. But that's not the number one purpose, purpose Jesus came to save, to, do, to save us. He came to save us from this place called hell. Listen to what it says. But your callous stubbornness and impotence of heart, you are storing up wrath and indignation for yourself on the day of wrath and indignation when God's righteous judgment, just doom, will be revealed. Storing it up. You know there's storehouses of wrath? Storehouses. I'll talk to you about it sometime this week. I think I've decided that I'm going to preach. I don't know. I, I, haven't, I better not say it yet. But next Sunday, I'm going to talk to you about there's different punishments for different people in hell. Just like there's different blessings in heaven, there's different punishments. Some people are storing up more wrath than others. Everybody in hell will suffer. But some people will suffer worse. People who mess with kids, they'll suffer. Without repentance, they're going to suffer worse. Jesus point blank says, you're going to suffer worse. They're storing up. They have a st storehouse as a punishment. You know, all of us had a storehouse. And then when we accepted Jesus as the Lord of our life, the storehouse was emptied out. There's no wrath on us. But can I say most of the people you probably know, they're filling up their storehouse of wrath. For he will render to every man, verse 6, according to his works justly as his deeds deserve. To those who by patient persistence and well-doing springing up from piety seek unseen but sure glory and honor the eternal blessedness of immortality, he will give eternal life. That's those who have submitted to the Lord. Not those who believe in, you know, the Bible says even the demons in hell will acknowledge Jesus as Lord, but they're not submitted to the Lord. It says that the demons in hell will say, yeah, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But the difference between that is that they're not submitted to the Lord. They're unrepentant of their sin. So a lot of people can speak that. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. I'm going to heaven. But our, the, God, Jesus said this, if you love me, you obey me. I've had, I've had people say they love their spouses, but they constantly cheat on them. And after a while, you're like, is, that's not love. And that's what people do to Jesus. They say they love him, but they constantly cheat on him. Then they say, they, they keep on saying, I love you. That's not going to cut it. But for those, verse 8, who are self-seeking and self-willed, Wow. And disobedient. All they think about is themselves. You guys, you know every marriage I've ever seen break up is because either one person or both, all they're thinking about is themselves. You know what, you know what breaks my heart for the kids is that then these two selfish people fight, use the kids as pawns and they act like they really care about their kids and all they care about is themselves. I've watched women destroy their marriages. And I've watched men destroy their marriages out of selfishness. Destroy their families. Then they say, well, I love my kids. Bet, but you hurt your, you broke their mom's heart. How can you say you love your kids if you're going to break your mom's heart, their mom's heart? I love my, I love my kids. How can you do that? And you're going to break your husband's, their daddy's heart and break their heart. Adulteries become so commonplace that there's websites on adultery. What is it called? I saw it advertised on TV. They got hacked. And a bunch of their names got released. But they still, it's a Canadian company that you can go on. And they advertised on TV. Married couples sitting next to each other, bored, calling this number and looking for other married couples that they, other married people they can cheat with. It's called, it's an adultery website. I guess there's multitudes of them now. 
Adultery has become so acceptable. Fornication. Matter of fact, most young people don't believe they have to even be close to marriage to have sex with each other. Because marriage has been so denigrated in the eyes of our culture that they, they don't even believe in marriage. Because all they see is mom and dad be selfish and mistreat each other. Or break each other's hearts. Why would they believe in marriage? Because it's become so socially acceptable. So they become self-seeking and self-willed. And this is it, disobedient, rebellious to what? The truth. Now they, they're rebellious to the truth. Can I, let me say, let me explain this to you. We have, a, we have an eternal God, right? Right? We have an eternal God. We know there's an eternal life. It just said you have eternal life. and It's about to say eternal death. And so there's an eternity there's an eternal God and there's an eternal afterlife. We're, we all will exist forever. Once you were born, your spirit, your soul will exist forever, okay? We're eternal beings. We were created by eternal God to be an eternal people. So our blessing for, for submitting to the Lord in this life is eternal life. The punishment, though, is also eternal. Some people teach annihilation that once they get thrown into the lake of fire, they're annihilated. There is no more. They just don't exist. That's so convenient. That's so good. They're saying, God's so merciful. He won't punish them forever. Oh, yes, he will. You know why? Because they'll never stop sinning. Because even in hell, they'll be rebellious. That's why they're saying there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. When do you gnash your teeth when you're angry? They're going to gnash their teeth and still shake their fist at God for all eternity. And that's why they'll suffer for all eternity. I want to change your paradigm. God said, man, you guys are so worried about food and clothing and your cars and your houses and all your stuff. And he said, put my kingdom first and I'll supply that to you. What does it mean to put God's kingdom first? Number one, it's to live for him. Number two, it's to live a life and have a heart for those who don't know him that are going to be punished like this. I'm, guys, you know why I love the church? I love the church. Why I've always tithed and served in the church way before I was a minister. Why I love the church is because I went to church. The church people invited me to church. They took me to church. They paid the electric bill and they paid the pastor. And the pastor, why I love my pastor to this day. He preached the truth to me and told me about heaven and hell. Told me how much Jesus loved me and wanted to rescue me. And I got saved in the church. It's the church. Why don't you love the church? That's what God would say to those who don't give or serve or care. Why don't you love the church? Why don't you love the lost in your family enough to solve your marriage issues and solve your stuff and get over yourself and, and set an example for them and love them and pray for them into the kingdom of heaven? Because when they breathe their last breath, they will, their eternity will be sealed and most are not going to make it into heaven. Most of the people you know will not be in heaven with you. I've said before, this is why I say what I say. That I used to think for my sons, I want you to be the greatest athlete and the smartest. I want you to be Michael Jordan and Albert Einstein. I want my daughter to be Mother Teresa and Margaret Thatcher. You know, I don't, some of you don't know who Margaret Thatcher was. Great woman in Great Britain. But anyway, uh, smart, brilliant leader. I want, But now I don't, I, I'm like, God, you deal with all that. I just want them to come to heaven. It's all I want for them. 
I don't know if it's because I'm older. I just think because I'm older spiritually that I realize this life is about heaven and hell. And whatever you experience here, whether good or bad, will be insignificant to you. The only thing that will be significant when you breathe your last breath is, is whether they go to heaven or hell. The only thing that will be significant to you when your children, your loved ones, your mom, your dad, your friends that you care about, your cousins, your nephews, your nieces, your uncles, your aunts, only thing you'll care about when they die is where did they go? But we can't wait till they die to care. We've got to care now while they're breathing. And they're not going to listen to just what they, we say. They're going to see how we conduct our life. And we're not going to be perfect at it. So when we're not, they're even going to watch how we repent and apologize and say I'm sorry and get things right. They're even going to watch that. What's it worth to you? This place is forever. The self-seeking, self-willed and disobedient to the truth, but responsive to wickedness. They, they love wickedness. They respond to wickedness like that. But they are indignant to the truth of God. That sexuality is only right between a husband and wife and a man and a woman. They're indignant to that truth. They hate the truth. And man, I don't hate them back. I don't. We can't. We have to love them back. But not deny the truth. Not give in and cave in. Man, it grieves my heart when I see these parents cave into these things. Their daughter or son comes and says, I'm a homosexual. And they go, all of a sudden, they become the biggest homosexual advocate on the planet. Or I'm a, I'm a boy, but I want to be a girl. Now, all of a sudden, they're the biggest transvestite, whatever, transsexual, whatever they call that, on the planet. Instead of saying, no, I love you, no. They just cave in when their son comes or their daughter says, I'm just going to live with that boy. I'm going to live with her. I'm not going to get married. Yeah, we're having sex. And yeah, they buy contraceptives and they buy pills and they do all this stuff. And they just cave. When are we going to stop caving and saying this is wrong? I love you. I'm not saying it because I hate you. God doesn't put these parameters because he hates us. He puts these parameters around us to protect us. They're not walls of prisons. They're, they're a wall of protection to save our lives. Mm. He says this about the wickedness, those that are responsive to wickedness. There will be indignation and wrath. They're going to be indignant. And there will be tribulation and anguish and calamity and constraint for every soul of man. That constraint means it's, they're going to be in prison. There, there's going to be no escape. For every soul of man who habitually does evil. That means Without repentance. It's not that we all haven't sinned and done evil. But without any kind of sorrow. Not towards each other. Towards God. Without any repentance. That means that without any change. Without any growing. Without any progression. Without any concern. The Jew first and also the Greek. Or the Gentile. Habitually. This is going to go on forever and ever. It's going to be eternal death forever and ever and ever and ever. Luke 16 tells the story of the rich man who goes to hell. He didn't go to hell because he's rich. He, go, he went to hell because he was selfish and self-willed and indignant to the truth. He went to hell because he had a, a man named Lazarus laying at his gate that he wouldn't, even, he wouldn't even come out and comfort him and give him a plate of food. He wouldn't even give him the craps, the craps, the scraps that fell off, or the craps. He wouldn't give him the scraps that fell off his table. He wouldn't even carry him a piece of bread that he was going to give to his dogs or his pigs. He wouldn't even carry it out and give it to this man that was right that he saw every day. 
And the reason God uses this example, and it says Lazarus, he got so sick. He was so covered. He was covered in boils. He was sick. He probably had cancer. And he's laying at the gate. He's so weak. He's just begging for food. And he said, now he's comforted. What he's saying is, you can live the worst life on this planet, the worst kind of torture and pain and whatever. But if you go to heaven, you'll be comforted forever. And that 60, 70, 40, 30, 14, 20 years that you experience pain will be insignificant to the beauty of your life for a trillion, billion, quadrillion, infinite amount of years of goodness. But your, your rebellion for 60, 70, 20, 14, 15 years towards God, and you breathe your last breath at 70 or 14 or 30 or 80 or 90, will be punished forever and ever. And this man, he cried out for mercy, but you know what the mercy he wanted? Someone give me something, not mercy to be forgiven. See, even in hell, he was indignant. Even in hell, he did not acknowledge God. He didn't cry out to God. He cried out to Abraham. And then he said, send that guy over there that used to lay at my gate to give me some water. Still selfish. Still indignant. Send him to give me something. Not, not repentance. No sorrow. No tears of, my gosh, I've sinned against God and rebelled against God. None of it. Still selfish. That's why their punishment will be eternal, because they won't change. Nothing will change. They will be in rebellion to God for not a billion years, not a trillion years. Do you understand that people you love and care about could end up there if we don't start loving and caring about them more? It's why you've got people up here all hours of the night working on a drama. Because they care about the lost. My question is, do you care enough to change your life? Start living better, more right in the eyes of God. Do you care enough to repent for your sins? Do you care enough to sow your time, your money, your effort, your love, your caring into those around you who don't know God, who aren't submitted to his lordship? Or are you just going to be mad and angry and walk in unforgiveness and, and piddle around and do, deal with all your petty feelings and self-pity and all your junk and all this negative drama? And I feel, you know, are you going to deal with all that? Are you going to live in that your whole life, that life of selfishness? You're going to get over yourself and say, there's more at stake here than my feelings. My stuff. What is your number one prayer? A new car, a new house? God's not opposed to a new car and house. Is that your number one prayer? Or is it souls? Is it your children, your mom, your dad, your Tia, your T.O., your cousins, your family? Are they in your prayers that don't know Jesus? How many do we have to bury? that we have to try to figure out somehow to say they went to heaven. We try to justify it some way they made it. When God says most won't, hearts need to be impacted by this message I'm preaching. He saved us from this. When are we going to care enough to help others get saved? I know when I preach these messages, some people are going to be a bunch of hype, emotion. You think whatever you want to think. This is the heart of me. You're hearing the heart of me. This is, I'm the pastor of this church. This is my heart for this church, that we care about, we honor God first and we care about the lost second. I'm going to heaven. I'm taking care of. My family's going to, I, they're taking, I, I want everybody else to go. forever. What's, what's up with that man in Luke 16? He thirsts forever. He'll thirst forever. I'm not talking about a little thirst. I'm talking about Sahara Desert. Lost in the desert for a week thirsty. I'm talking about dying of thirst. He'll thirst forever like that. 
What else is, is he experiencing? He's in a flame, burning alive. He's feeling the pain of burning alive. And it will never stop. I'm like, why would anybody choose to go there when Jesus died to rescue us from there? And why would we not care about people that are heading there? That Some of them, this guy, this young man had never been asked that question. Why don't we ask those questions? Why aren't we on our knees, tears, crying out to God for the lost in our family? Why are our hearts not moved anymore? Move to tears, move to our knees, move to hours of prayer through the night for our children and our, our, our moms, our dads, our dads that are hard-hearted and aren't going to make it. Why aren't we praying for them while they're living? After they're dead, the, that time of prayer is over. But fight for them now. Burning forever, thirsty forever. The Bible says, where the worm never dies. You see those movies where insects come out of people's ears and eyes and worm eats them continually. Comes out of their eyes, their nose, their ears. And they're watching, they're feeling this, they're experiencing this forever. Guys, I'm not, I'm painting you the picture. This is, this is what hell is like. This is why God loves us so much that Jesus was willing to step out of heaven and come to earth and be punished for us. That's how much I love God because he, that kind of love, oh my gosh, I can't repay. Wow. That he was willing to empty out my storehouse and take all that wrath that punishment I deserved and dump it on him to save me and you. I just want you to care. I just want you to remind you today he saved us from that. I thoroughly hope that you enjoyed the message and got something out of it that you can apply to your day-to-day life. Because that's what God's about, is living with us day by day and having a relationship day by day. And in order to establish a relationship with him, if you never have, it's important that you ask him. You know, he, he's extended his hand of love and he, he came and died for us and he's made a move and he said, listen, I love you, I care about you. I died for you to save your life. And now it's our turn to respond. And let me say something about God. He said in his word that his justice triumphs, or his mercy triumphs over his justice. And the gap between justice and mercy is grace. What grace is, is an unmerited favor. It means I didn't deserve this. I can't earn it. It's just a gift of mercy. It's a gift of favor that I cannot earn, did not earn, that he's just giving as a gift. And he's offering that to you. Let me say this to you about God. He's a God of justice. In any nation, in any people, any household, if there's not, if it's not just, if it's not right, if it's not fair, then there's going to be chaos. There's going to be all kinds of problems and hurt feelings and victims, and and it's just going to be ugly. And that's not who God is. So His justice is pure and right. And what justice demanded was that anybody who sinned pay the penalty of sin, which is eternal death. And God, that's that grace, that's that mercy party, tipped the scales in our favor by sending Jesus to say, I'm going to die for your sin, and I'm going to conquer sin's right to dominate our lives that Adam gave over mankind, and I'm going to, I'm going to eliminate sin's right to dominate you. Then I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to give you eternal life. And he said, anybody that will ask me for that, I will save. So I want to pray a prayer with you if you've never prayed or you've you've prayed before and you've fallen, I want to pray with you too to get back up. If you've never prayed, I want to pray with you to establish a personal relationship with God and let Him save you. Let Him help you. It's what He wants to do. He loves you. He loves me. It's what He came to do, but He won't force it on you. He's extending His mercy. Don't demand justice over mercy. Don't demand that He treat you you know, with justice and give you what you deserve. Because if you do, you're not going to like the results. Take advantage of the gift of mercy while you can.
pray this with you. I'm going to ask that you close your eyes to remove distractions around you. And then I'm going to ask you to speak this. You don't have to whisper it and don't yell it, but just speak it in a normal voice. And just be honest and sincere with Him. And say this with me. Say, God, I believe that you sent Jesus to die for my sins and for anybody's sins that will believe it. I believe you love us and love me that much. And because I do, I ask that you forgive me of all my sins. And I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead and you conquered sin's right to dominate me and sin's penalty, eternal death. And you want to save me from that. Well, I believe that. And because I do, I say to you, Jesus, you are the Lord, Jesus Christ of my life. You gave your life to save me. Now I give you my life. I trust you to teach me, to lead me, to guide me, and to teach me how to live life and life abundantly. It's what you came to give me. Teach me. And I thank you for forgiving me and saving me, restoring me. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you. Amen. Now that was a great decision that you made to pray. And I want to encourage you, if you don't have a church home, a place to go to church, come to church on the Lord. We didn't pray this prayer to trick you into coming to church. It's not, it's not a game. We're, we're the family of God. We're not going to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. We're not going to be perfect. But man, we're a family. And we want to invite you, if you don't have a church home, come to Church on the Move and join us. We need your gift and you need our gift. We need your help and you need our help. And so come join us. In the meantime, God bless you. Have an awesome, awesome day.